What is up and welcome to the Bruin Bible episode 12. We have a regular in the house, Mr. Mike Regalado in the building for the podcast. Mike, how are you doing today on this fine Thursday? Good, thank you. I'm um, just waiting. You know, bye weeks are always weird because it's like, okay, you know, time for rest. But, you know, from a fan perspective, you know, you can't wait to see your team perform, whether it's good or bad. But I can imagine UCLA fans, um, they want to see more of what Chip Kelly is doing uh, this season. And Fresno State is going to be a really good test. Fresno State is going to be a really good test. I want to rewind back to the LSU game. You were actually at the game. Am I correct in that? That was nuts. Yeah, it was uh, quite an experience. Uh, I mean, I picked, uh, you know, on the show, um, I, uh, <clears throat> I picked you to win on the show. To win, <laughs> uh, I had an 11-point win. Uh, they didn't the, – UCLA won by 11 points, not the exact same score, but uh, f- for betting odds, uh, you know, people should, you know, just listen to me. I actually don't. I'm not – I don't know what the gambling scene is like. Don't take advice from me. But I will tell you what I think is going to happen uh, between uh, UCLA and their next opponent. So, Well, I think you should take Mike's advice because he was one of the few that did pick UCLA over LSU – And frankly, it wasn't close. I know the score may have seemed a little closer, but I've never seen a UCLA team dominate the line of scrimmage like they did against a powerhouse, a team that won the national championship two years ago Mm -hmm. with LSU. Um, I know it's been a couple of weeks, but, boy, the defense is kind of the storyline of the season. I know the running game has been sensational, and we'll definitely talk about that. But, I mean, just the blitz packages they were throwing at Max Johnson, the quarterback, for LSU, this guy was running for his life on plays. You know, you got guys like Mitchell Agude, who, by the way, may be the most impressive Pac-12 player in the entire conference through two games on the defensive side of football. He's been a disruptor, to say the least. Quantrez Knight is making plays, using him like we talked about in the preseason. The guy you reminded me of was Jamal Adams for the Seahawks in the NFL. Kind of that guy who comes up in the run game, blitzes off the outside. He has been such an impact maker for the Bruins. And then just to see Quentin Lake out there making plays. I mean, he broke up back-to-back passes that yeah. were so big in that early third-quarter drive that LSU had that played a huge part in uh, LSU punting and UCLA going down the other way and scoring. Give me your assessment on the defense because, you know, I think coming into this year, it's like, well, if the defense can, you know, be competitive, we think the offense is going to be good. This could be a very solid team. I'm thinking, especially with what happened at USC, and believe me, we're going to be talking about the Trojans. This defense could be a top 40, 50 defense in the country. Do you think that's crazy? No. <clears throat> and it's it's an interesting mix of what they're doing because just overall, you're looking at the defense and you're seeing bodies flying around. You know, you mentioned, a, you know, a bunch of guys who are contributing or, and they're, you know, stepping up. They're, they're huge contributors to this very aggressive, very active UCLA defense. Um, you know, you – you uh, brought up Quantrez Knight, and it's weird because he's not getting all the stats. You know, guys like Mitchell Agude are, you know, getting um, the tackles for a loss, fumbles, sacks, tackles for a loss, guys like that. Um, and Quantrez Knight, obviously, he's like the 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 voice. Um, he, he's like the energy behind the defense. You know, I, I've kind of thought of him as kind of like an Obi Wan Kenobi type of character. Love it. You know, the old guy who who knows what's up, trying to guide the young the young folks. But you know, when he needs to get in there, he he he's just going to wreck stuff. And um, you know, it's just everyone is just following suits with um, this plan that that uh, um, this defensive scheme, which was helped introduced by Brian Norwood, has been um, a, a huge uh, f- a force under Jerry Azanero. And it's it, it's interesting because a lot of people that, that know UCLA uh, have said that the, that the defense has suffered. Well, now we're just seeing guys flying around. And, you know, they are, you know, just, so, you know, I'm, I'm deep into the stats. Let me, you know, I got some right here uh, really quickly. UCLA's total defense, only 324 yards. They are allowing 286.5 yards um, through, the air, through the air. But two things. Um, 
I'm going to get into the rush defense, which they're only allowing 37.5 rushing yards per game. Let's get into that soon. But the other thing, you know, going back to pass defense, 286.5, when you really break that down, you know, teams have to pass against them. And that's why that number is huge Um, because defensive passing uh, uh, passing yards per attempt is only 5.8 for UCLA, which is 37th in the nation. Yeah, that, that whole passing defense stat, that's something like 117th. Not good, but when you look at the actual passing yards per attempt, 5.8, that's that's a huge step up for this team. Um, <clears throat> I wouldn't say it's elite defensively, but that's still really good. Now, let's talk about the run, the run defense. My gosh, yeah. Two, two, days, two, two days, two games in a row, UCLA has held their opponent to under 50 rushing yards. Hawaii, uh, what did they get? Twenty six, and I think uh, LSU got forty nine. LSU, an SEC powerhouse, only got forty nine yards against UCLA's uh, run defense, and it's and that's not going to stop. Um, obviously, I think that 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 average is going to increase. Obviously, you know because teams are going to find a way to scheme around them, but I don't think it's going to get much. Uh, uh, you know, increase much more, uh, maybe double. I mean, you kind of have to only 37.5 yards per game. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I would not be upset if that went over 70 yards per game. If it was 70 yards per game at the end of the season, that's still really good. Yeah. It's still really good. Yeah. Um, and against Fresno state, Fresno state's not a, a great run team either. So I think that numbers like at least for this next week is going to stay there. But we have to focus on what's happening with the passing game. Um, they have an, an, an amazing quarterback. Uh, they have a lot of guys that, that pass the ball around. Actually, Fresno State's team reminds me of uh, the early Jim Mora team with uh, Brett Hundley, how he would move the ball around, you know, a bit of a run threat. He had several um, offensive weapons. So uh, it's going to be a, a big test for the Bruins. I, I'm, I'm more scared of this game for UCLA than I was LSU. Wow, that's a big statement, and there is reason to be, you know, that, that, that this could statement could be very real. They went into Outson against an Oregon Duck team that just beat the Ohio State Buckeyes and were leading late in the fourth quarter until yeah. they blew that game. I mean, this is a team that can compete. Their mm-hmm. offense looks great. The quarterback you mentioned, Jake Hayner, he's the first quarterback in the FBS right now to throw for over 1,000 yards, eight touchdowns. 73.6% completion rate there. He's got two really good receivers mm-hmm. uh, and two local kids, Jalen Cropper and Josh Kelly, both over 200 yards receiving through those three games. So it's going to be – it's a spread offense, quick read type of situation for Hayner. And their defensive line has been very good too. They have a couple guys – I think they're averaging 10 tackles a loss per game. Just think about how crazy of a stat that is. Yeah. One of those games included the Oregon Ducks. Kevin Atkins and Aaron Mosby are a handful from the Bulldogs in the defensive line. But with that being said, I feel very confident. I think Fresno State is a great team, and this does Mm -hmm. scream out trap game, especially after an LSU game. But we had an extra week to prepare for them, which makes me feel a little bit more confident. Maybe we got out all the celebrating last week and kind of got to work this week. Um, I still think our run game – could be top three in the country, maybe number one when all is said and done, given what we've seen from the offensive line. I mean, we were dominating up front, rushing the ball with Charbonnet, Britton Brown. We haven't even seen Dorian Thompson Robinson kind of break out yet on the ground, Not which is yet. something to watch for, because I think we're actually going to let him loose a little bit more against Fresno State. And I, I feel confident. I think my prediction for Fresno State is that we win by two scores. It'll be very close. But I do think we pull it out at home. I think this team is built to last. And, uh, yeah, what do you think about that statement? No, it's a – it's – you know, you you hit all the, you know, big points. Um, As far as trap game, um, I I would just kind of disagree slightly. People have been bringing bringing that to my attention. And, you know, with trap game, it it kind of implies that that teams are looking past uh, a certain game uh, when they have a bigger game. Um, uh, you know, in, in the next week or on the horizon, um, UCLA has Stanford, which just had a statement win against USC, but it's still stand. There's still a lot of questions for Stanford, but either way, um, that's for Chip Kelly and his players. From what I've seen, 
Um, the Stanford game does not exist right now. It's it's Fresno State. They are 100% locked on to Fresno State. And, uh, you know, I was talking to some of my podcast partners and they brought up a good point that, you know, they, they all the players heard all, all the, the, the rah-rah, the hoopla, all the, 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 the cheers, and UCLA is so great. And then they were on a bye week, and then Oregon kind of surpassed them, beating the number three team in the nation. And that was good because it seemed to temper that – excitement and so um you know that was something i didn't think about um which is yeah you know all of a sudden the attention is off of them it, it kind of helps to not always have questions or people you know saying you know how good you are you know what's going on either way uh chip kelly has always had this team focused and i right now all their from 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 what chip kelly has been saying from what i've been seeing it's all about fresno state they have to focus on on fresno state if they don't get this win it's not going to de derail their season but um uh even if they lose by like a point it's st they still lost it's still a loss and it's still going to set them back just slightly. And it's going, you know, depending on how they lose, it's going to uh, raise a bunch of questions, but you know, similar to you, I do think that UCLA will, will take control of this game. Uh, they are going to have a lot of trouble with Fresno state, but I think that UCLA just has a lot more talent and um, the scheme on both sides of the ball is just dizzying for opponents. I mean, just, I can imagine the stress that, that the Fresno state uh, defensive coordinator is going through right now. Um, but at the same time, that's what's going through the heads of uh, yeah, yeah, most, that's what's most likely going through the heads of the UCLA football coaches. How are we going to stop Hayner? How are we going to limit these these uh, wide receivers? Uh, you know, how are we going to you know on the offensive line? How are we going to try to uh, keep the the uh, Bulldogs Fresno uh, the Bulldogs uh, defensive line in check? So it's going to be you know a, a really good game in that aspect because there's going to be a lot of balance. This team is is a bit more uh, has a bit more advantage on this side. That team has a bit more advantage on that side. That's what's going to make this a really good game. I totally agree. And I think these are two really good offenses that are going to be matching it out. You can make the case that this might be a more complete offense than LSU is right now. So not a game to walk over. And I agree with your point um, in terms of a, you know, a trap game. This is a solidified opponent. They can't be looking oh, at it yeah. as a trap game. And it's reassuring to hear that Chip Kelly is treating it that way. Um, I kind of want to touch on some key points on the offensive side of the ball. Charbonnet has been absolutely more than advertised through two games. Yeah. I mean, looking like one of the strongest running backs I've ever seen. And this goes back to a guy that I've watched a lot in the NFL. He reminds me just in terms of when he gets hit by that first defender, his legs keep moving almost like a Marshawn Lynch, where it's just so hard to tackle him. Two or three defenders coming up. I mean, this is LSU defenders. A lot of these guys are going to get their shot in the NFL. He's dragging two or three guys, four extra yards, you know, to pick up some of the stuff he has. One of the questions I asked last week uh, to our guest was, do you think if this continues, Charbonnet could be in the hunt for maybe like the Doak Walker award because he's averaging over 13 yards a carry right now. It's <laughs> almost, it's literally insane. Like yeah. and his touchdown runs, you know, the first game alone, it was 21, 47 and 21 yards. It's yeah. one thing for the line to create a hole, but, He's outrunning defensive backs at his size, like 6'2", 220, and that speed. This guy is just a handful. What has been your impressions of Charbonnet, and do you think he could be on those award watch lists when all is said and done? Uh, my assessment of uh, Zach Charbonnet, um, to quote the great Cl Clubber Lang, pain. <laughs> this guy is just he's, – he's, he's a human pinball He's just he just bounces off dudes and he just doesn't care. He he will smash through people, and it you know we've seen it. It, it takes multiple guys to take him down, and and not just to take him down, but to you know contain him. You know, Charbonnet will have a you know there will be a guy that has Charbonnet in his sights, and Charbonnet will just do a quick you know left right you know quick juke, and boom, he just has another five five extra yards. Um, so he's just been you know a wrecking ball, and it's it's. Doubly impressive the fact that he's only part of what UCLA's running game can do because, you know, not to be overshadowed, but Britton Brown is actually doing uh, is also pretty impressive as well. Um, I think in the against LSU, Charbonnet had 114 yards. Uh, Brown had 78, I believe. He's averaging something like six yards per carry. That 
if Charbonnet is not ready, just give it to Britton Brown. He's going to have you a first down and two downs, you know? <laughs> so yeah. it's like, he's, uh, this is just an amazing, um, you know, feat that, that, that we're seeing by both uh, running backs, but you also cannot over, you know, uh, you cannot overlook UCLA, UCLA's offensive line, and, and not just their offensive line, who has just been spectacular in a lot of the pin pull situations, but their tight ends and their wide receivers, who have helped open up lanes, uh, you know, are, are going across the play to to set blocks so that Charbonnet can get those extra five, six, ten, fifteen yards. It, it's just amazing how connected and 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 uh, 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 just in the zone the entire offense is when, when, when they have the ball. So, um, you know, it's definitely, you know, it's, it's great that you have guys that can actually, you know, put their head down and, and get you those touchdowns, those long yards, but it, it, it all comes together because of the mind of, of Justin Fry and Josh Kelly. Uh, I mean, Josh Kelly, <laughs> Chip <laughs> Kelly. Um, Josh Kelly is the receiver for Fresno State. <laughs> and former UCLA <laughs> running back Joshua Kelly. So yeah. There uh, is – I mean, it wasn't a, it wasn't too bad of a Freudian slip, man. We have former Bruins like that. So Yeah, uh, you know, and also, you know, Deshaun Foster uh, with the running game, getting those running backs prepared. Um, it's, it's just a really good – uh, coming together cohesiveness right now. And we saw a little bit of it last, last year, but now things that things are really starting to, to, to come together for UCLA's offense. And it helps that the defense is balancing, balancing things out by, you know, getting the ball back, you know, after, you know, for three and outs, uh, you know, if they, you know, if the opposing team drives down the field, they're holding them, you know, they're, they're, they're holding them to, you know, the 40 yard line or something like that. Uh, they're, they're, they're holding them to only field goals rather than touchdowns. Um, so it's really impressive. You know, I don't, you, you don't want to toot their horn too much. And I know the team doesn't want to either because it's only two games, but from what we've seen compared to what we saw the last three years this is night and day. This is, this is quite a force to be reckoned with. It's insane. And this is, I mean, this is as advertised chip Kelly specialized in changing college football with the run game. That's what he was able to do with the Oregon. He finally has the personnel to do that at UCLA. When Britton Brown, like you mentioned is your second tailback. That's a hell of a second tailback. <laughs> This guy, I mean, is probably a top three, top four running runner in the Pac-12 in general, and he's splitting carries with, you know, maybe maybe outside of C.J. Verdell, the best back in the Pac, with which is Charbonnet, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Got to give Verdell his due because he went off oh, at yeah. Ohio State. He was phenomenal, but just such a luxury to have those two guys there. Um, Mike, give me your prediction for Saturday's game. Do you think the Bruins get it done? And what is your final score? What did I, I think they do. I think this is going to be the closest game. Um, even though I'm picking, you know, a, a double digit win. I think this is one that's going to test the Bruins a little bit more than they have been. Um, maybe hold, you know, maybe neck and neck through two and a half, three quarters. But I think UCLA, uh, they finish uh, strong and I'm predicting uh, what was my prediction? I think it was um, 35 to 18. A weird score, but it's a weird year. <laughs> it's that last, that last, that last week's uh, uh, last week in a college football was just nutty. So I'm, I'm, I'm starting to input Im, embed the crazy and chaos into my predictions and, and what is going on this year. So, <laughs> no, I think that's a fair estimate, man. It was one of the weirder college football, like weeks in just yeah. memory, whatever, everything that happened last week. I'm with you. I think they win by two scores. I'm going 41-27. I think it's going to be 34-27, maybe late in the fourth, and either Charbonnet, Brown, rip off a huge run. The one guy I do want to touch on, too, before we go to USC and their coaching search, they finally let George Kittle drive this past week or two weekends ago against LSU. Mm -hmm. Boy, was it awesome. I mean, he made only three catches – one of them was a 75-yarder where he's outrunning LSU defensive backs. Two of those guys are going to be probably first-round picks. Mm-hmm. He had that huge third-down conversion on third and long in the red zone that essentially kept the drive alive. We didn't have to kick a field goal. We punched in a touchdown, which kept the momentum with us. 
Greg Dolcich, man, this guy is a walk on and he's arguably the best tight end in the country after what I saw against LSU. Give me your assessment on him and just kind of how far he's come since he's been here because this dude walked on at UCLA and now he's his two biggest games of his career against USC and LSU, two powerhouse teams. Yeah, and it it also, you know, says a lot about what UCLA has been able to do with tight ends. I mean, you had Caleb Wilson a few years ago. You had um, – Aussie Aussie. Uh, Aussie Aussie. You had um, uh, the other Wilson I'm, I'm blanking on. So they have a good uh, collection of, of tight ends. And also for next season, they have two four-stars coming in. So they're not going to stop. Can't stop, won't stop, you know. Um, and – but the thing is, the development is good, but to find a diamond in the rough like Dulcich, like you said, he was a walk-on who's now considered one of the best tight ends if in the conference, if not the nation. Um, just his moves, like he caught that one ball uh, from Dorian Thompson Robinson who pers- you know, set it up perfectly. For those who uh, mocked uh, DTR's uh, accuracy in game one, Okay, you had a little bit to go on there, but he, it, DTR has showed that <clears throat> when when the ga- when the play call is right there and it takes the defense, you know, off of their game, um, and you set up your receiver with your quarterback, you know, he, you know, you have to make that throw, and he did, and then Dulcich did, just did the rest, you know. The ball was uh, uh, kick off, uh, kicked off. I think it was UCLA's third drive of the game. They had scored. Um, LSU just scored. So to go 75 yards on that play, to have Greg Dulcich just do the rest of the work, juke one guy, and then and then it's funny. If you look carefully on that, on that catch, there were two guys that tried to bring him down near the goal line. If the, if the second guy did, never showed up, Dulcich would have been tackled probably within the uh, around the five and four, four yard line. But with that second guy, he kind of grabbed him, tackled him, and he bounced off him into the end zone. So I don't know if, if Dulcich saw that, if he was able to just brace himself, but to have the wherewithal of where you're at, where your defenders are at, and to bounce into the end zone is just. It's just amazing. Yeah, I just you know, it's got you know, right there. <laughs> Rishnikov like moves from you know, Mister Dulcich <laughs> in the open field there, man. It was unbelievable to watch. And I mean, I'm a huge 49ers fan. He wears 85. He is always reminding me of Kittle because he's so fast <laughs> once he gets the ball yeah. and he goes towards contact. Like he is not the guy that's going to catch and go out of bounds. He's like, bring it on. I'm going to go through you or around you. Yeah. I mean, it's just it's so much fun to watch and. You mentioned all those great tight ends, the Wilsons, the Aussie Aussies, the other Wilson. He might be the best when all is said and done, at least for this individual year, you know, yeah. we're really looking back on it because this guy and depending, I mean, he looks fast on the field. I think he could run like a four, six. If he plays his way, his cards, right. This guy could be a top two round pick next year in the draft. I really, I really believe that given what I've seen from him and how he's beefed up NFL is in this guy's future. He's in the conversation for the Mackey already. A couple more big games from him. We could be talking about a first or second round pick. Um, I love it. You got UCLA winning. I've got UCLA winning. We have to talk about the arch rival across town. Clay Helton fired after the embarrassing loss to Stanford this past weekend. I want to hear who, in your opinion, do you think is a realistic option for USC to get? And who would be the coach that you would – hate the most if they were able to get him as a UCLA fan. I mean, that's all tough, uh, honestly, because it's just, it's so fresh and we have what, 12 more weeks of the season. (laughs) So, um, you know, I don't know. It's, you know, I, I, I don't want to speak on USC too much because I don't know, um, what is going on, in, you know, in their administration and in, in, internally, but you have to note that they have made some big time mistakes in the past with big coaches, time. not just hiring coaches, but, you know, potential, you know, um, ADs as well. Uh, and now they seem to have a guy who, you know, Mike bone, he's done some good stuff, but it, it you know, it's weird to say this, but now, 
I measure, I, you can measure someone, a, a, an athletic director especially, against what Martin Jarman has done at UCLA. Martin Jarman has changed the culture. He has been the face of the athletic department. He has done so much. Mike Bone hasn't really done that. He's just been another administrator that took his seat and is doing what he can for USC. Now, will he, you know, I'm sure that he's going to, he's getting a, a lot of pressure from boosters and, 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 and uh, alumni, but I can't really speak on what he, uh, what he can do. It's unless there is like some sort of, um, you know, you know, shift in mentality, um, they have to get someone. And I can't believe, you know, I'm, I'm vying for you, USC, to actually do this. But <laughs> you have to get someone who will take complete control and will just do whatever uh, um, they need to to win. Is that possible when you have someone like Mike Bone who might have might tinker a little bit behind the scenes about <clears throat> what co- what assistant coaches should be here and stay or whatnot, this and that? You know that that's something that the the, the incoming coach is going to have to deal with. But um, you know, as far as what coach can can bring him back to the pom- promised land, you know, it's hard to say because all the main ones, um, you know, have, have you know they're, they're they're saying what they need to. Like, oh, I need to focus on this week's game. Blah blah blah. But uh, you can, you know, reading the tea leaves and what sources are saying to uh, to reporters, um, you know, I think uh, um, I'm blanking on his name, the Penn State coach. James uh, Franklin. Thank you. Franklin is probably the one I would wow. be worried about the most. Um, you know, there's been talk of Eric Bieniemy, who's also good, but at the same time, he hasn't had uh, a head coaching gig. Um and you know, just to you know, obviously it's not similar. But when the U, when UCLA basketball was looking for a coach, um, you know, a lot of people were saying, "Oh, you should you know look you know internally you know check out these uh, former UCLA players who are now coaches." And the thing with that was like, yeah, but they don't have head coaching experience. They you know, they don't know this current culture. Um, and then they go out and get you know go way outside the box and get Mick Cronin, and boom you have a final four team. You have all this excitement and fervor in Westwood at Poly Pavilion. Um, you at USC kind of has to do something like that. Again, I hate the, the fact that I'm talking about it, but from an unbiased perspective, if USC wants to get back to prominence, they need to hire a guy who's just, who they're going to let take the reins, um, who is not on, uh, you know, suspect, if you will, like urban Meyer, you know, that's just that's always been kind of like weird to me for for USC to go out and get Urban Urban Meyer. You know, yes, he's a great coach, especially college, but been a little you know shady dealings you know behind the scenes. You know, when he was at oh, Florida yeah. and then leaving a program after you know only a few years, he hasn't really set a legacy uh, at you know one spot. You know where you know he was at Utah, then he was at Florida, then he was at Ohio State, and he's left for for various reasons. So. Like that one, I just you know I think USC has to be a little bit smarter to go after someone like like Urban Meyer, who you know even you know even aside from his health problems, you know he is an older gentleman who's been around the game for a long time. You know how long is he going to be in this gig? So you know I think they they don't need to go out for you know, a young hotshot. What they need to go out and do is find someone who will um, uh, who is a pro- who has a proven track record, um, can recruit. Uh, can bring in his own people and 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 put in the culture, the the smash mouth culture, in my opinion, that USC is known for. And one, you know, and if they do that, and um, they they need to let him do it. They they can't interfere. Let the coach coach. Uh, let him have c- complete control of the program. They know what to do with their staff. Um, you know, that's just what they need to do. Uh, if they let someone like Franco uh, Franklin do that. I think USC is going to be, you know, on the path to success quicker than, you know, quicker than we know. I think you're spot on. And I think the pressure is on, especially if UCLA has a big year, which we both think they are on their way to doing if they can continue to pile up these early wins. Yeah. Because it's a matter of taking back the LA fan base. They've kind of whiffed on the last three coaches. Uh, yeah. Sarkeesian now at Texas, uh, Lane Kiffin now at Ole Miss. It's kind of funny because it's Nick Saban's rehabilitation program for both those guys. I think the joke running around was how much time is it going to be till Clay Helton goes and joins Saban's staff and then yeah. another job <laughs> like the other two. 
Um, but, you know, this is the third guy that just has been mediocre with the talent and prestige that USC does bring to the table. I think you bring an excellent point with James Franklin. If they can get him, I mean, that is a very, very good hire. And, you know, that would be very tough to compete against in state. I've got a couple other hot potential hires. We mentioned Urban Meyer. They're probably not going to get him. I mean, he just went to Jacksonville, but they could get his former defensive coordinator, is now head coach at Cincinnati. Luke Fickle has done a great job with rebuilding that program out in Cincinnati. Yeah. Uh, he was the defensive coordinator for Meyer at Ohio State. So you may not be able to get him, but you may be able to get his coordinator. Brings in similar philosophies. He's won wherever he's went, so that would be a great coach. And then kind of the outlier pick, and I want to hear your reaction on this. And, I mean, if they were even thinking about this, you were talking about getting recruits there. Deion Sanders, prime time coming to Los Angeles. I mean, X's and O's, I don't know if it makes sense because he is a first-year college coach. Yeah. But if you can bring that guy in with some coordinators – if he walks into a recruit's house, it's going to be very tough for them to leave and be like, hey, I'm not committing to prime time. I mean, you and I are football fans. Players are football fans themselves. Everyone knows about Dion Primetime Sanders. If he went there and they surrounded him with the right coordinators, I would think they would have a top three to four recruiting class every single year with Dion Sanders there. And you match it with the Nike presence. I mean, that would just be something special. Definitely. Um, but is that what USC wants? Um, we, we, I, I think they need to, um, that would be awesome. <laughs> I mean, that would just bring a lot of attention and that will help with recruiting. But honestly, you know, even in a bad year, USC doesn't, uh, doesn't suffer that much in recruiting. I think right now what they need to focus on is bringing um, a coach that, is confident and knows how to run the ball, pass the ball, uh, defend against the ball. Um, and, you know, it, like this year, I think we'll add a lot to, to the uh, mystery around Deion Sanders, but um, you know, even if they, you know, what if they do something like bring in like, like Franklin and B enemy uh, that would be scary, you know, just something like that. It's like, Hey, uh, Franklin's going to take over, but hey, uh, I want to hire you know Bienemy as the OC. That's just that's just stuff like that's going to be killer. You know, I don't know if their coaching philosophies would mesh that well, but I think that's the route that they need to go uh, with proven uh, coaches with proven track records. Um, so you know, like I said, if it you know if if I was USC, knowing their legacy, uh, you just have to you know trust uh, the the coach to do what they need to do to get this thing back on track. I totally agree. Last question I got for you, Mike, before we sign no. off, <laughs> you're betting your next paycheck on who is the head coach at USC a year from now out of those candidates we just talked about. And it very well could be somebody we don't even know. Mm -hmm. Are you betting that's James Franklin or who are you betting on? Honestly, I would probably – I, I'm scared. I'm, I'm kind of scared of Fickle, which tells me that that might be the the <laughs> the new Trojan coach. Uh, he's a really good coach. He turned that program around. He knows how to recruit, um, and he's doing it all out of Cincinnati. You know, a Group of Five team rather than a Power Five team. Who's um, yeah, they're in the top top ten, I believe. Um, so having it, you know, having that much success at a school like Cincinnati, and I'm not demeaning Cincinnati, but like I said, they're right. They are a group of five team rather than a power five team. Having him go in and do so much with so little, that is going to be huge for, you know, any huge program, which, you know, all of that is, you know, already inserted. Oh, we have the, 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 uh, the facilities, we have um, the location, we have um, the recruiting. We just need the, the coach. And that's pretty much it. They just need to get a coach. Um, and so, you know, if they get, you know, if, whether it's Luke Fickle or Franklin, uh, I think that they will do very well. But right now, I would bet that they would get Luke Fickle. Luke Fickle is the guest from Mr. Mike Regalado. Yeah. Let's hope whoever goes there loses to the Bruins consistently. Um, <laughs> Mike, this was a lot of fun, man. We got to do some uh, ska punk reviews next time around. 
My dude, great to see you as always. <laughs> Have fun at the Rose Bowl, and let's get another Bruins W. Thank you. Yeah, we're going to be out of there uh, probably Sunday at 5 in the morning. That's going to be a late game. That's total Pac-12 after dark. <laughs> Pac-12 after dark is right. Bruin Bible, we just